Welcome to Dale's Beekeeping Videos. I'm a master beekeeper and tonight's lesson is on how to make a modified snell grove board. It's also known as a double screen board because it has two uh, meshes, screen meshes on either side of the three quarter inch board. Um, so it was a fun little project and this is my first design so you'll see how to create something from the beginning. What a snell grove board is used for is there's multiple uses it's used for uh, swarm prevention you can also use it for uh, to put a weak colony on top of a strong colony and get them through over through the winter or through cold nights um, again there's a lot of different uses for it um, again those are the most two common uses for it uh, and again it's a fun little project if you want to make your own if not you can buy them um, mostly what you're going to find is a full snell grove that board and that'll be a separate video as a true full snell grove board or a double screen board as it's also called will have six different gates this is just a simpler version of it is so it is a two inch opening a one eighth inch mesh screen on both sides of a three quarter inch board and a three eighth inch railing around it and allows the bees come in so you would have a weak colony on top of a strong colony and then the heat would come up from the the lower colony that's strong and help warm the weaker colony. In the case of, uh, of a split, you could also uh, use it in the, if you're making splits while you're establishing that first queen. Again, it'd be a separate videos on all that, but again, this video is on what the, the, the device is and how to make your own. Um, so enjoy the video. Okay, I'm now at my workshop. It's an outside snow converted uh, Cyan collection barn uh, that I've converted to make my beekeeper equipment. It's about 45 degrees. It's in January. It's a great time to make equipment uh, getting ready for the upcoming season. So what I'm making today, um, as I stated earlier, is I'm making uh, snail grove boards, both the snail grove board and the modified snail grove board, which the modified version just does not have the six gates um, that I fully intend to use in my apiary operations this year. So I'm going to show you this piece first and then I'm going to take you in and show you actually how I cut the, the pieces for it and make the equipment. Uh, but what I want to show you here is if you're working by yourself, it's a lot of times it's really hard to uh, maneuver a full sheet of plywood. So the easiest way for a single person to maneuver a full sheet of uh, plywood is when you go to Lowe's or Home Depot's where I get mine, uh, ask them to make uh, three cuts in your plywood. They'll do it for, they'll usually do one cut for free, they say, and they'll charge you 50 cents for each additional cut, but every time I've done it, they've done all three cuts for free. Um, so, like I said, I get a full four by eight sheet of plywood. Um, this is just a three quarter inch uh, sheeting plywood. And then from there, I ask them to cut it into two foot sections. That way, it makes it much easier to maneuver on my table saw or my job site saw. Um, by myself so I just want to show you this and it, with each one of these uh, two foot sections I can get three snell grove boards um, so if you do the math three times four sections uh, I can get 12 snell grove boards out of one sheet of plywood by having uh, Lowe's cut it into three sections you do get a little bit of waste um, but it's not enough to worry about it uh, if you were to buy a snell grove board from your local beef store they're going to cost you about $26, $25 for each snow grove board. And by using, making it out of three quarter inch plywood and uh, some one by material, you can make it for less than $3. Uh, so again, I just want to show you this piece. Now I'm going to reset the camera and show you how I set up and make the cuts. Okay, so now I'm out in my shop itself. And so the way I do it, uh, make my cuts is I don't have to do a whole lot of measuring the way I do it. Um, because I let the, I use the measurements off an actual piece of gear whenever possible. Uh, I will have to do a few measurements for the snail grove board simply to align the holes, um, but it's really simple. So the first thing I do is I grab my wood, in this case it's three-quarter plywood, so um, I'd already pre-measured it, but it's basically the same thickness as a regular piece of one by material, and I just raise the blade uh, just a little bit above the wood. Um, and one caveat to this before I, ever, before I get into it, um, it's important that you uh, know how to tune up your uh, equipment to make sure it's making a straight cut. And also you should look on YouTube and other videos uh, from somebody else that knows a, a lot about power tools 
and make sure you know uh, what a kickback looks like and how to avoid it. So when I'm making my cuts today, I'm going to be controlling you know, uh, the working piece is going to be up against my guide fence. I'm going to be controlling that piece. I'm going to be paying attention to where that blade is spinning it at all times. Uh, so keep that in mind and also have uh, the safety pieces in, installed in mind today. I have the riving blade on the back side of my saw blade. You probably can't see it in the camera that far away. But what that does is as I'm pushing the wood through, the wood doesn't come back together and create a potential kickback situation and come back on me. Um, so like I said, make sure you review all safety uh, precautions and when I actually do the cuts you'll see that I'm going to have eye protection on I'm going to have ear, ear protection in to protect my ears uh, and again I don't have any loose gloves or anything on or loose equipment that can get caught in that spinning blade so again make sure you look at your videos uh, from somebody who uh, does a lot of woodworking uh, this is just my technique of how to do it again you assume your own risk whenever you do your own building so again the first thing I want to do is I want to raise this um, blade up and on my particular saw, I have I made a zero clearance insert, and you can buy these um, off the internet. Um, and then there's again there are videos on how to actually make this narrow cut in here, um, so it really cuts down on the chances of wood falling down in here, and it also helps reduce the risk of a kickback as well, because um, again it's very there's no clearance on either side of this other than uh, it's just a blade. Um, so like I said, the first thing I do is I raise the blade up so it's just a little bit above the wood uh, so that way when I push it forward, I'm not having a big blade spinning at me. It's just a very little bit. Again, I'm going to watch where my hands are. Um, if I were working with smaller pieces, I would use a push stick. In this case, it's plywood, so I've got to use both hands to control it, um, to, again, to keep a thick kickback. So the way I set this up, I first set my blade up. The next thing I do is... Um, I grab the piece of clear that I'm going to use. In this case, it's an eight frame box. And if you're using a 10 frame box, again, you can get three of those snail grove boards uh, the same way. So in this case, uh, a snail grove board is going to fit the exact outside dimensions of the box. So I just simply set the box up and then I move my fence till uh, it touches the box and the box pushes up against the blade to where it just barely touches the blade. Uh, and it should run freely back and forth as you go and there shouldn't be a gap as you go as you push it through so that's how I get the width if you do this this technique is how I do it and I get a perfect cut every time um, if it and if it somehow gets a little bit off which is extremely rare that it does the bees don't care uh, so this is how I do it so I make uh, the cut like that um, and then I'll just toss the excess wood when I'm done uh, so I'm gonna make the first cut I'm gonna set up and make the first cut Okay, so now I've got my uh, protective earplugs in and my eye protection in. Again, if I thought my hat was going to fall off, I'd probably take that off too. In this case, it's not. Uh, so I'm pulling the wood back well away from the blade. I'm going to start up my saw. I'm going to push through it. Um, I'll try to cut this part of the audio out so you're not hearing the blade spin. Uh, so I'm going to make these three cuts. And then I'm going to shut off the video and I'm going to grab my other board. I'm going to make a total of six of these snail grove boards today. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to start it up. Again, watching where that blade is at all times. Okay, so now you saw uh, how quick and easy it is. So one point of emphasis as I was pushing it through, this because this board was between the blade and the fence, that's where the potential for kickback is. So 
I was pushing down and in with my control hand as I was pushing it through, and I'm pushing it, holding it uh, down here, and I'm pushing it uh, with my left hand, but mostly just keeping this piece uh, controlled from warping on me. Never, ever, ever push against the wood once you get to the middle part of the blade or, or more. Preferably, you, you don't do it uh, for the blade. Again, so because what happens if you get on the back side of the blade and you're pushing in on the outside piece, you could actually cause it to tip in and then kick back on you. So never, ever, ever push against the outside of the board and go beyond the middle part of the blade. Preferably, I was told by carpenters that you don't want to actually go uh, further than the front edge of the, the board as well. But again, you're making the majority of your control with this uh, part that's in here. Again, if I had a smaller piece of wood, I would actually have one of these pusher sticks. And again, it pushes down, and I'm using a pusher stick on the opposite side to push against the wood until it got to the blade. Um, and again, just keep the wood from popping up, and it's holding it up against the fence. So again, point of emphasis on that. Um, I'm going to shut the video down. I'm going to go cut these other three boards. This is now scrap. I could set this inside. If I thought I could use it for anything else, I could uh, just save it. In this case, it's scrap. I don't have any other use for it, so I'm going to toss it in my scrap barrel. Okay, so I've now set my saw up uh, for the other cut. You'll see it. I'm going to show you how I actually set that up. So, so all I did was I cut with that first cut. So all I did was cut for the uh, one side of the board. Now, as you can see, I put the plywood up on top of my eight frame box just to show you that you still have to do another cut uh, just to get it the, the proper length. So again, just showing, I've got it here just to show you the over length. So I just got my boards off to the side. So the way I set this up, like I said, is I've got my table saw set up and the power is off right now. Uh, blade's not turning. So I just simply line up the center of my box with the center of this uh, blade. And then I simply take and I move my fence with the box until it just lightly touches that blade. And then from there, I go ahead and lock in my um, fence. And then I just simply, as in, when I push it back and forth, you'll see that I just I do a test. I always do a test run first to make sure that I'm not getting any binding. If I'm getting any binding, then something's not right. Um, so I need to check. Oh, I know what it was. My box is dragging on the back side of my, uh, of my saw blade, That's, or my table saw. So again, I just make sure I've got a smooth run through there and nothing's binding. Again, it should just lightly touch the blade and not spin it. Um, one thing about this DeWalt saw, if you get uh, too far over uh, and you get too much of a gap, it does have this little fence where I can actually uh, rest it on that as well um, so it doesn't move. Um, that could have been also what was going on. Again, I'm not a carpenter by trade, uh, but again, you can see how easily it runs smoothly up against it. All right, everything's running fine. Nothing's binding. So I'm going to set this aside. And now I'm going to grab my wood. Again, pay attention which side you've cut. Again, you can see how I've cut the long axis with the blade before. Now I'm going to cut this other piece off. Uh, again, pay attention which side of wood you want to waste. In this case, I've got a nice little divot in this wood. So I'm going to cut this in. That's going to be scrap wood. Again, same thing here. I'm going to control this with my hand. And I'm going to make sure that uh, my hand does not get beyond, definitely not beyond the center of the blade. Um, and then whenever I take the wood away, I'm pushing it off the side and preferably turn the saw blade off. Uh, push it all the way through. Again, watching where that spinning blade is at all times.
All right, so I let the saw blade come to a complete stop. Um, from there, I'm going to simply take my blade down, and I'm done with my table saw. Because the rest of all that's all I have to do now. I take it back. I do have to make some. I have to do make the uh, the um, rails for it. Uh, so again, I'm done with that piece. I'm going to shut the camera off while I set up for the rails, um, and we'll go from there. Okay, so now I'm ready to make the raised portions of the snow grove, modified snow grove board, and also the snow grove, the actual snow grove board. Um, so the first thing I did is I'm going to raise up my blade. So this is the stock I'm going to cut my 3 8 inch uh, pieces from. So again, this is just nothing but scrap one by material that I have. Um, and I can get several pieces out of this. Um, so in this case, I just set it next to the blade and then I raise the blade until it's just barely above the wood, about the where the tooth is, coming above the blade. And then, so that's set that aside. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a uh, <coughs> metal rule or a tape measure, whatever you happen to have. This just comes off a off of a square that I have. Um, and now I'm going to set the fence to 3 8 inch. So again, this is a rip cut. Um, so again, I'm going off the inside edge. Um, so as I slide my fence over, do I get my 3 8 inch? And that looks about right. Lock it in. And then from there, um, if your um, guide doesn't fit through here, you can make a smaller one. In this case, what I did, I just made a smaller one. Again, I'm not a carpenter, so assume your own risk when you make it. This is just how I do it. You assume your own risk uh, whenever you make your own parts. This is just how I do it. Um, so as I do it, I've got my roller stand set up. So as I'm going to feed up my long stock, I'm pushing it through. Again, because the, the piece that I'm cutting is between the blade and the fence, that's the part that I'm controlling with downward motion and um, letting it, again, be in control because um, that's what's going to kick back on me. I, I'm not worried about the outside piece as much. Again, I'm going to push in on it before it hits the blade uh, on this side of the blade. I never go beyond the blade, uh, the center of the blade, and preferably never the, go into the blade itself. But again, you definitely do not because, again, it could pinch and then kick back. So that's all I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be pushing down on it here and just kind of letting it push through. I'm going to feed it through my, with my hand until it gets kind of close. And I'm going to pick up this smaller guide stick and push down and through it. Um, and once it clears the blade, then I'm going to stop the saw, let it come to a complete stop, and then I can run the next one until I get enough. And then I'll take it over to my compound miter saw and then cut the lengths that I need. All right. So getting set. All right. So I got my push stick ready. Everything's set. Okay, um, again, if I leave the audio one when I actually do the final edit of this, um, you would actually hear the, the blade uh, bogging down. And what was happening, because this board um, is old, or for whatever reason, it wanted, as it was going through, it was trying to naturally curve, curl back in itself. That's why this riving blade 
that comes on these saws now, it's why it's important that you leave that thing on because what can happen is that as it curves in and you don't have that riding blade, it can hit it that front of that blade and kick back on you. Um, so again, as I got closer, I was making sure again, pushing down and in, but this pusher stick never went beyond the ed front edge of this blade. Uh, and I tried to not even get at that, but again, uh, I tried to keep it outside of the blade. So again, applying pressure against the fence and then pushing in um, with this pusher stick. Again, so you can see I've got a nice long piece to work with. These are all three, three eighths inch uh, long. And I'll make a, uh, a few more of these um, and I'll go on with it from there. So I'm gonna turn off the video as you saw how that worked. Okay, so we're building this together. Truth, uh, full disclosure, I haven't built one of these before. Uh, so we're building this together. So you get to see how I go about whenever I make stuff for the first time. This is how I do it. I basically uh, either A, get the plans off the internet and do it. Again, I'm not a carpenter or I deconstruct one that it's, that's already purchased. In this case, I don't have either. So this is how I make it. So it's, you saw me make the blanks first, again, the width and length. So the next thing I did is I took my eight frame. This is the box I typically use for my template uh, in my workshop anyway. That's all I did is I came and measured the uh, center line of each axis. And that's all I did is I transferred that to my board. And the reason I did that is so uh, whenever I get ready to do this in the future, I don't have to measure anymore. So all I have to do is come back to my center lines on my template. And this becomes my template going forward. I don't have to do much measuring anymore. Um, so what I'm trying to do is I've got a five inch hole. This is going to be the modified uh, double screen board, or again, some people will call it a Snell Grove board. Um, so it has two holes uh, and mine are going to be five inches. So again, I just marked off on my box. So I have my template going forward. I came in and transferred those lines to my, uh, what will become the modified Snell Grove board. And then from there, I figured out what I wanted to be it. Uh, so I just came off, I got my nice cross on my board. And then from there, I figured I'll come an inch either side of that. Um, and the nice thing about this Linux hole saw that I purchased, it has a nice plus with a bunch of holes in there. Um, so it actually helps line, keep the, the, the uh, blade lined up as I'm lined up. So I just trace the lines either axis. And then from there, I just slid it up. I use my rule. And I just line up my rule an inch and then I just slid my hole. And again, because I now have the lines in there and I can see through these holes, I can uh, get an accurate spot on it. So I've got it one inch this way. I did the same thing. I just reversed it after I traced the line around it. I did the cross uh, in the center hole here where the arbor is going to go. Um, again, I just go one inch up that uh, back line. And then from there, I just line up the holes. And then I've got my nice spot from there. I just took my pencil, marked my little plus in there. And then just for giggles, um, I just transferred the, the mark around it. Again, as I'm figuring this thing out. Um, again, I want to show you that step. So if you end up making your own equipment, uh, that's how you do it. So what I'm going to end up doing, the plan is, is this will then become my template for the future uh, as well. Uh, so I will cut these holes out. And because this will be the exact dimension, I'll be able to go in there and um, just simply trace around the holes and then drill. Again, it doesn't that, it's not an exact science, uh, so these holes can be off a little bit. It's not that big a deal. Um, so I want to show you that piece. So now I'm going to reattach this to the uh, drill. Um, and then from there, because I don't know what it's going to do, what it's going to spin, I'm going to have to clamp this board down for the very first hole just to make sure it doesn't go flying off every place. Um, I don't think it will, but I wanted to make sure my drill is going to be running very slow when I actually make the cut. Um, so here we go. I'm going to turn this off for a second. All right. So as you can see, I've clamped it down with some eight inch uh, clamps just in case it wants to try to spin out into outer space. Uh, so again, it's just a safety precaution. I don't think it actually will. But again, I want to make sure I did it. Uh, just as a safety precaution, I'm going to go ahead and cut the, uh, turn the camera off, cut the first hole. I'm going to protect my camera in case it does fly off. Uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so I did make that first cut, and I'm glad that I, cut, that I 
aired on the side of safety and clamped it down. It did try to spin off. Um, I'm not sure it would have flown off very far because I probably would have clamped it down to my table saws. But I have this custom, uh, made uh, bench that I made myself uh, for building stuff for my bees. Um, so I just use these 8 inch clamps to clamp it to the edge. And again, when I did it, I make sure that the 2 by 4s that it's sitting on, this plywood sitting on, um, that the hole's not going to go into those 2 by 4s But I'm glad I clamped it down because it did try to spin off. The other thing I want to show you, the other thing I like about this Linux bit, the, my drill's unplugged right now, so it's not dangerous. Um, in one of my videos, I talk about some tools and stuff to, to have. Um, I, I like to use one of these wide tip screwdrivers. Um, and what I like about these Linux hole saws is they've got a slot where if you get a plug in your wood and it wants to stay up in there, um, you can actually use some type of screwdriver and then punch it out, help punch it out out of the plug. It's in my sugar shake jar uh, video where I talk about how to make sugar shake jars. Um, so again, I'm just going to work this out. If you had a smaller screwdriver, that would work as well. But <clears throat> again, it's dual purpose. Um, again, just work my way around, spin it around until it pops this plug out. It's a quite big plug. Again, you're seeing me make it just as I make it. Um, so again, you see how this works. The other thing I like to have, and it'll come in handy whenever I get ready to uh, attach the uh, 3 8 inch pieces around it um, after I make them on the modified snow grow board, um, that's good to clip in uh, staples that come out. So again, you see the one hole there. I'm going to turn on my drill. I plug in my drill. I'm going to drill this hole. And again, I'm going to try to control the drill as best as I can, uh, as slow as I can. If you have a drill press, and I actually have one, if you were to clamp this down and use the drill press, it's probably a lot more controlled than trying to use one of these. Uh, in my case, I've got a half inch drill. Um, I like DeWalt tools, they're really good tools um, for my power tools. Um, so again, I'm gonna cut this out and then I'll, I'll use this as a template to draw it uh, when I get ready to cut the others. All right, I'm sure you saw in the video, it was trying to buckle on me, even with these clamps. So again, make sure you got your clamps down pretty good and tight. Um, you can saw it clamped, it was, it was trying to buck pretty good. So I'm glad I did this. Uh, I'm glad I showed you that uh, steps I go through. Again, everybody assume your own risk if you decide to make your own equipment. I'm just showing you how I do it. Um, if you decide to do it, you have to figure out what works for you and what's best safety practices for you. All right, you can. You're watching the design process in the in in real time. Um, so what I end up signing it on is I still gonna take my this becomes my template from now on. Um, so it's all I do is I still trace around the hole so that way it kind of gives me a rough idea of if I'm running the hole saw through. Um, again, this isn't an exact science. It doesn't have to be exact. Uh, you're not making cabinetry. You're just making a hole in a board. It's all you're doing. Um, so what I end up signing on was. I decided to, in addition to um, tracing around the holes, I decided to figure out where those center holes, the center of the holes were, and then make a little cross on the piece that I'm going to uh, cut out uh, later on. So, so again, uh, remember I, I did my center line of the board uh, of both axes. That's what this line is, and this line here is. And then from there, I just figured out what the center of the hole was, and I traced, I made different marks on my template board and then I drew a line across drew a line across <coughs> and again and then I drew the center line down all the way through and then what I need so all I have to do is now that I've got that my center marks so all I have to do is go in with take this metal uh, ruler um, or yardstick and I simply line it up on my holes again adjust for the pencil a little bit it's not again it's not a look big deal if you're off a sixteenth of an inch you know, again you're not making cabinetry work uh, so then I just go in there make my first line my first line spin it 90 degrees again come off my index marks that I already have come in 
make my cross make my cross now I've got a T so from there I can simply take my template which so this will be in this state from this point on uh, for as long as I run this pattern um, this will be kept in a store a, a dry place where I can use it as my template um, so now I can simply clamp this thing down again making sure that it's going to be clamped where it's not going to hit the underlying supporting 2x4s nor is it going to hit my table again clamp it down really well and I probably could have used that template and just drilled on through it um, but I don't want to widen up the hole anymore And that's the beauty of having what I'm finding is is where I drew around even though I've got those crosses uh, I can actually eyeball it now uh, once the bit as you can see the bit sticks a little bit beyond this uh, hole saw um, so I can roughly line it up with those plus that cross that I made and then from there I can just roughly tweak it a little bit till it lines up perfectly with the holes and now I'll go Again, the trick is to go very slow with this drill. Again, if you had a drill press, you could actually set the drill speed on it uh, and then go from there. Um, so I'm going to turn off the camera again so I'm not, you're not seeing all the time, the labor intense. All right, I'm set up again. Uh, it's going to get a little dark, so hopefully the videos will turn out okay. Uh, I do have my light, so, uh, so again, I like to set up templates uh, so that I don't have to do a whole lot of measuring so I've got my piece here so what I'm creating now are the um, rails that are going to go around that your hive body would set on top of the snail grove with again it's remember I cut these out earlier these are 3 8 inch thick pieces which is B space so what I'm going to create first is this back edge uh, template so I just simply again because I don't like to do a lot of measuring I can do it on the front edge or the back edge doesn't matter um, so I'm just going to line it up, edges are square, and then from there, I simply take my pen or my pencil, and I simply mark the front edge and the back edge, I can roughly draw a line in between them. So from here, here's the piece I'm going to keep, and that's actually going to be across the back. So from there, I'm going to take this and I'm going to transfer it to my saw. With this DeWalt sliding compound miter saw, what I love about it, is you turn the light on and it's a light that goes on either side of the blade and what that does is that creates a shadow of the blade uh, so you can tell exactly where you're cutting so because this piece I'm wanting to save this piece to the right I'm going to make sure my blade is to the left of my line of cut so I drop it down I see the shadow of the blade make my cut again what I like to do is I like to come over and just verify it one final time, make sure I cut it properly. In this case, it's smooth on the edges, flush, so it's good to go. So from there, I can take a pencil and mark it, and mark it as Snell Grove. Back. Template. I, I like to work, write the word template on my templates so that I know exactly what I've got. Um, all right, so that piece will get set there. From there, I go ahead and I transfer, I make sure it's flush. And then what I like to do, again, I like to use an ink pen more than anything because it's, it's a steady place all the time. I don't have to worry about the, the pencil marking come down. So I just mark on top of my board. Again, I don't like to do a whole lot of measuring um, when I do my piece. From there, I go ahead and grab my stock again. And I'm going to create two side pieces, and they will be identical. So from there, I just take it to my index mark that I just created on top of my board. 
Again, I only have to do this for the first one as I'm making my template. Make sure it's flush. Still on my mark. I come up and mark the front edges. So from there, because I want this piece to my left now, I'm still going to keep it to the right as I've still got a good hand control to the left. Uh, so I, I make sure I'm cutting to the left of the mark still. And if all else fails, you could cut a little long and then um, still make another cut if you need to trim it. So again, now that I've got it in place, I still put the back piece down there just to dry fit it. Just make sure it's still it's setting properly the right length. And it's flush on the front. So I know I, know I now have a good piece. And to make sure that I've got a, a good template, I simply mark it. So I go Snell Grove. Side. Template. Alright, and I'm going to make one more just to show you uh, what the final product looks like here in a second. Um, and this is how I transfer it anyway. At my saw, I'm going to have it on the saw here in a minute, but it's all I do uh, is I come over to my edge, and if, if you wanted to, you could actually cut this edge to make sure it's, it's perfectly square. In this case, I know it's a factory edge, so I'm not worried about it. So it's all I do is I take my template, and I hold it flush against the edge, and this is how I, I get away with not um, measuring. So I get the ends flush, I simply turn them down to the opposite end and go right across the end, and I've got my reference mark. And then from there, I will go cut this other piece. All right, so it's now set on there, and the piece I want to save is to the right, so I want my saw blade to the left of my mark. And now I have my side piece. I've got a side piece, I wanted to, and my side piece. Now what I want to do is I want to create uh, my front piece and I want a two inch gap. Lay this on there, create an index mark, and then measure two inches off of that. Uh, however we want to do it, it's the easiest way. Um, so I'll show you this way, see another way. Again, I just make my little index mark off there. I can make my index mark off of here. So now I have my, I've got a couple of marks on here because I was messing with it, playing with it. Yeah, all right. So if I wanted to, method one is I simply, now I've got an index mark there and an index mark here. And so all I have to do is come back with my wood that I'm going to cut and go in between those two index marks, um, come back two inches from it. So I take my Measuring stick. And I come back two inches from it. Again, it's not exact science, not a big deal. So I come back two inches, make my mark. Or again, so that's method one as I come back um, two inches off that. And then or I can come back two and three quarters inch. And then from there, I've already created this other index mark. And then from there, this is a piece of wood I've still got from left over. Um, so it still fits, so I don't waste a lot. So I just come in and line it up, index mark to index mark, mark it on the wood. And then when I know it's a piece of scrap wood that I'm not gonna use, I'll simply mark an X on the edge of it. So that tells me that ends not, I'm not, not gonna use it for anything. All right, make sure my index mark, my index marks line up on my piece to be cut. In this case, because I want my control, I'm in control on my left hand, my piece that I'm saving is now on my left side, so I just got to remember that and put my blade to the right of that mark. All right, so I could have easily done it with the longer piece. I just happened to have a short piece that would still fit. Um, so now I just dry fit it and make sure everything works. And then I will label everything as my templates. Everything there. Everything's there. 
Again, this is the front. I just make sure it lines up. Again, I want about a two inch, but it doesn't have to be exactly. So I've got a nice entrance there. Um, so you can see what the rails look like. So now that's all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, I only need one piece, two pieces, three pieces for the template. This is just to show you what it looks like. So now I've already got one of my side rails done. Um, so there we go. I will still label this as the Snell Grove front. Again, I like to mark it, so it's Snell Grove front template. And then what I'll do, because this is a modified uh, Snell Grove device, I'll put an M on it, dash M. That means modified, my own short, uh, abbreviation. Because remember, I'm going to make another Snell Grove uh, device uh, that's a true Snell Grove board. Um, that has the six um, gates on it. So this is a modified version of it. A lot of it's very popular. It's also called a double screen board. So I've got my three templates set up so I can make repeated cuts now. Um, so that's all I have to do is I, remember I cut a front and a back and two side pieces and then from there we can go from there. And then that's all I have to do now before I attach these I will pull out my 1 8 inch mesh screen and then lay it on here and get it ready to cut, to cut it out and staple it. Um, but I can go ahead and cut these pieces out. Now you've seen this, I'll go ahead and mark them out and cut them out and then just set, it, set them aside. I won't attach them until I've attached my screen because it'll be much easier to attach it with the, the screen without the um, boards on. All right, I'm done with the saw so I can turn it off, turn the light off and I like to unplug it. For safety purposes, it's now unplugged so I don't have to worry about inadvertently getting myself. So the next thing I want to do is I'm going to grab my 1 8 inch mesh you buy in a roll from your local hardware store. This is 1 8 inch mesh. Okay, so I laid out my marks for my um, 1 8 inch mesh uh, that I'm going to cut out. I did the first part on the ground just so uh, you didn't see every little step. Uh, that's all it is. You, get, you can get this uh, 1 8 inch mesh from your local hardware store. Uh, they can special order it if they, if they don't have it in stock. Again, 1 8 inch mesh hardware cloth. Um, and get it in a roll. I forget what it costs, like $100, $150 for the roll. Um, but you'll, you'll use a lot um, if you make your own equipment. And you don't waste a whole lot, especially if you make other stuff like uh, ventilation boxes and things like that. So again, I just take my box. I, I'm going to set it off to the side. So that's all I did is... I measured out, I want one inch all the way around. Uh, so that's all I did was I cut a, uh, this hole's five inches. So uh, five inches in diameter. Uh, and I have a two inch gap in between them. So that makes it a, and I, I measure it with the measure rule stick just to make sure that I wasn't off on my measurements. But it ends up being seven inches. The wire mesh is going to be seven inches wide by 14 inches long. So that's all I did is I took my, uh, metal measuring stick, rolled out my roll on the ground, marked in about four different parts, uh, places across the wire, and then I took one of these little permanent markers, scripto markers, drew it, I took my metal ruler, marked it, and then what I like to use, get them off Amazon or your local hardware store, it's a 10 inch uh, uh, whisk, uh, all purpose scissors, utility scissors, they'll cut through this wire mesh like it's nothing. Uh, you can also use tin snips. These work great. Uh, I got them on Amazon. I forget how much they are. They're not expensive. Um, so that was, I measured off the 7 inches. It's going to be the long axis. Now that's all I have to do is measure off the 14 inches. I've already done that because uh, it doesn't really show well on the camera. So that's all I did was I measured it. Again, marked it in about three different places, three or four different places. And then I took my metal rule and then I drew a line across it. And then to help me from cutting off the, avoid cutting off the wrong piece, <clears throat> I simply drew an X on the bad side so I know that I don't uh, cut on the wrong side of the mark. So from there, I just simply take my whisk scissors and cut that black line. This is the part where you might consider having some leather gloves just to protect your hands from this metal. Um, again, so this is a scrap piece. Again, I've got a scrap bin that I save this stuff in. I'm just going to toss it aside for here. Again, you'll find lots of uses for that stuff, so don't throw it away. You're going to find, if you make your own equipment, 
you're actually going to uh, use a lot of stuff, and there's going to be very little waste. Um, so I've already measured the second piece. Again, you need one because this is a double screen board, as its name implies. You need two screens. <coughs> Toss it aside, set my scissors aside. So what it will be now, and get this ruler aside so don't break it or bend it, um, it's going to be one on either side. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my Harbor Freight pneumatic nailers and nail it that way. You could also use uh, staples if you want to, although I found when I use those little mechanical staplers, they're not as effective going into plywood. Uh, so, I, again, I like the little Har Harbor Freight uh, pneumatic nailers. So when I bought mine years ago, they were about $25, so they're really cheap. Uh, Harbor Freight makes some really good tools for inexpensive. All right, so I'm going to turn the camera off while I get the pneumatic nailer set up. And I'm going to show you how to do this piece. Okay, I've got everything up uh, to show you, ready to show you. Again, I normally do this outside on my custom-built table that I made. Um, but since it's getting, it's already dark, I'm in my shed, so I've got some light, and I'm augmenting it with uh, direct light. Again, when you make this, you're not making cabinetry, so you'll see that when you get the screen, it's a little bit screwed just because of the way the screen is on the roll. Not a big deal. Um, so that's all I'm going to do is I'm going to use some Harbor Freight tools. As I told you to, you're going to need two um, if you're going to use the pneumatic uh, staplers. So in this case, I've got uh, a central pneumatic stapler. Uh, it's a 20 gauge wide crown stapler. It's item number 68028. Again, that's 68028. Um, and then um, it's super easy to load it. It comes in these with these little wide crown staples. Um, when you load a pneumatic stapler, you always, always, always want to load it with it disconnected because if you have a misfire, it could go into you really quick. So on this one, it's really easy. I've got it disconnected. I just pull up on the lever, pull back on the arm. Uh, I pull out this little staples again. It's wide crown. Um, load it, push it in, and then from there, making sure this tip is always pointed away from me. Now I've got safety goggles on, and then I'm going to connect my pneumatic stapler, just pull it back, seat it. I've already done a test shot um, in some wood just to make sure it's firing properly. I haven't used it in probably about a year now. Um, so I'm just going to roughly center this uh, 1 8 inch mesh screen over the hole. So I'm just going to staple it down to where a bee can't crawl underneath the mesh. So I anticipate about uh, four or five staples per side. Um, so again, when I made this, I made it one eighth, or excuse me, one inch wider than the holes, so I got plenty of room for air. Put it down, get positive control, staple. And that, again, I like to wear earplugs in at all times. Um, so again, I just do three, stretch it out with my fingers, stretch it out, stretch it out forward. Again, now I've got the centers. Um, and then I like to come in the center, even though it's probably not necessary. And I'll put three there. Again, these staples are dirt cheap. And then just to keep it from one, t my hands getting in, tearing it up, uh, getting torn up, I'll actually add a few more staples along the margins in between those three staples. That one's still sticking up a little bit, so I'll just add an extra one there. Same thing up on top. I'll just add another one just to keep the bees from getting underneath it or me from getting my fingers next to it. And it goes just that simple, uh, just that quick. All right, so that's one. Flip it over, remember there are two sides. And that's the purpose of the double screen board is to keep the bees can't uh, touch each other and they can't pass a, the queen pheromone around. Um, so um, it makes it really easy. If you get it sticking up a little bit, you can just bend it over a little bit um, to get it to sit down a little bit tighter. And not a big deal. Line it up where I've got uh, wire on all sides. Again, since this isn't one sticks up, I'll just nail it first. Again, do my three pieces, stretching it out, and then I'll stretch it out laterally. Watch my fingers that so they're not getting nailed. Come down the center. Come down, get my centerpiece. Same thing at the top. And then I'll just start filling in the gaps. Oh, doesn't want to get down, so again, I'll just add an extra one. Not a big deal. 
is pretty fun to do. Again, what I'm looking for is now that I've got it, I'm just making sure that there's no gap that a bee could crawl in. Um, and as I'm messing with it, that uh, I don't nail my hand on this mesh. Uh, what I've seen some beekeepers do is they'll take uh, their table saw and they will, there's another piece sticking up. Um, they'll actually make a uh, one eighth inch tall shim or, or cleat to go around on top of this. Just another way of doing it. it keeps them, what that does is it keeps them from uh, tearing up their hands as they go through here and hit this wire. I'm just going to be careful. I'm not worried about it. I can always add that later should I need to. All right, so that was that piece. That goes on just that quick. Oh, that's sticking up a little bit. I'll nail that one too. Same thing over there. All right, so I'm going to disconnect it. Put my little protective cap on it just to keep critters out of the end of it. And I'll set aside and clean this up a little later. So the next thing I, want to do, I need to do is I need to put on my um, my two side pieces and my two end pieces. And what I'm going to use for that is I'm going to go to my second stapler. Again, Central Pneumatic Harbor Freight. Uh, again, they're inexpensive. Again, when I got them, they were about $25. They may be a little bit more now. Um, but again, not that big a deal. This is the second one I bought. They last for years. Instead of paying $150, $200 for a stapler at one of the big box stores, Harbor Freight works great. And I've used it a lot. Uh, 18 gauge 2 in 1 air nailer slash stapler. Um, it's model or item number 63156. Again, 63156. Great tool. If you go on my Beekeepers United uh, Facebook group, um, I've actually got uh, a photo of all the tools that I use in an article in there on how to save uh, time and money saving trips, tips, and it actually has this photo in there as well. All right, so. Um, so what I like to do now is I it uses, the, it uses the narrow crown staples. So what I like to do is just to make sure that um, I can do the math of 3 eighths plus 3 quarters. I want to go about 3 quarters of the way into this other piece of wood. But what I like to do just to be on the safe side, again, I'm not a carpenter, is I simply take one of the staplers. I got a bunch of these in different sizes. They're, again, they're not, not that expensive. I just simply look at it and go, okay, it's a one-inch staple, goes three-quarters of the way through, this is my size. Um, and I always have, as I told you at the beginning of the video, I like this wide head, flat head, flat tip screwdriver. So if a nail pops out, especially when I'm making my high bodies, sometimes that staple will hit something and, and curve out. Uh, I can use this as a nail set, and then I use a pair of diagonal wire cutters to, to trim off the staple should it go awry. So again, because of the way this template is laid out, again, I just personally, so I get, to, especially the very first time I make a piece like I'm doing now, I'm making it from scratch. I always like to dry fit it first just to kind of make sure that I'm laying everything out properly. Um, the beauty of this board uh, is with this modified board, there is no slats underneath, uh, the cleats underneath. Um, because you've got on top of the frames, you've got B space there a little bit. Uh, with a cross, especially the way I make my high bodies, I make them a little deeper anyway. I make three-quarter rabbits all the way on three sides, um, so that it's a little deeper anyway. Um, but if you wanted to, you could always add another eighth-inch uh, cleat on the back side if you want. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set my back edge first. In this case, again, it's front back, doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to come in from the edge about an inch after I set my uh, tools in here. On this one, it loads slightly different. There's a little clip in the back. You just pop it and pull it off, and then you got to uh, put them on top here. So. Again, just goes right on top of the rail. The other one loaded from the bottom. This one loads on top. And I'm on. And it loads on top. And I'm going to load another small piece that I have. And then from there, I just ride it forward. And it's locked in place. Again, always keep it pointed away from here. So that way you're not nailing yourself. Open up the gate. Cinch it in. Set it in. Seat it. And now it's set. Um... Again, now I'm going to take my cleat, make sure it's flush on the sides and the back edge. I'm going to come in about an inch, so we, and I like to go at an angle. When I say at an angle to the wood, not front and back. Again, come back about an inch. And then from there I go to the center. Again, sometimes these boards will be slightly warped, uh, especially depending on how the wood grain is. Uh, so again, I like to tug on the wood a little bit, a push on it just so it's flush with the back edge. All right, so again, I'll get my, my centerpiece. 
and I'll put one in between. All right, so that was my back edge. Next thing I'll do is I'm gonna go ahead and rotate the piece. And because I know I built my sides off of that, I'm gonna put my first side piece in. And then again, if you dry fit it, you can see that, again, measure it and it should. And if it comes up a little short, like some, for whatever reason, this one's coming off about a 16th inch, not a big deal. Bees don't care. Um, and they're not gonna crawl through that. Um, or I can hedge it a bit, hedge it a little bit and move it off of that. Um, in this case, I'm gonna let it be flush. It's okay, not a big deal. So pneumatic stapler, come back about an inch, I'm flush off the edge. Nailed. Come back, flush on the edge. Keep your fingers out of the way of the stapler, because what I've seen, especially when I'm making the high bodies, is that nail can shoot sometimes, that staple can shoot off to the side. So you want to keep your hands, you notice every time I place my hands near the stapler, it's at least an inch away, preferably two inches away from the end of this thing. So if that nail shoots off and I've hit myself in the finger, I can tell you it hurts. <laughs> so again, coming back about an inch from the edge. In this case, I can't hold it, so I'm just going to hold it back. I've got it, it's in place. So again, I come in the center spot first, and now I can periodically nail it a few times. It's not gonna go anywhere. Um, if you've noticed, I don't use glue uh, in my setup. Um, reason being is I don't, personal choice, I don't use glue uh, because some glues can contain formaldehyde. I know that when they make these uh, pieces of plywood that there's some formaldehyde in it, you can't totally get away from it even though they claim it's formaldehyde less, uh, formaldehyde free uh, glue in these things. Um, I recently saw a couple different studies on them say that they actually are, there actually is formaldehyde in them. So again, I personally don't use glue in my setup. The bees aren't gonna pull apart. I've never had a problem with it. Um, so again, personal choice. All right, so again, getting it back, nail it about an inch back, come back to the other end. Come back to the center, put one in the center of each of those nails. So there it is. So now I'm ready to uh, make my front, whichever side I'm going to make my front. And because um, that was off a little bit, not a big deal. You can see, uh, even by it being off just a smidge, just about a 16th inch, I don't know how it happened. You saw me measure it. When I did it, it measured fine. Um, but again, Murphy happens. I don't know what happened. But again, not a big deal um, because Nothing can get in there. So I'm still going to make this flush. It's just a little short on that end. Nothing's going to get in the hive. It's not a big deal. All right. So again, I come back to the front, make sure the front is flush. Come back an inch. Get my hands out of the way. Nail. Come back to this end. Press down. Get my hand out of the way. Nail. 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 And that, my friends, is a modified snow grove board. Uh, some people also call it a double screen board. Uh, oh, there we go. There's what I was talking about. I was talking about those staples can sometimes veer, so it must have hit something and darted. So uh, now, that, now that I felt it, uh, I'll show you how this screwdriver works as a nail set. So again, if it were long, I would simply come in here and then cut it off with the diagonal wire pliers. In this case, it's not that bad. Again, I don't want to hit it with my finger all the time, so I'm just going to take my um, screwdriver, put it on the uh, piece, and treat it like a nail set. Piece of wood popped up uh, when I did it, splintered. All right, so now I've got that staple where it shot off and it went at an angle. Not a big deal. Uh, it's out of my way now. And then when I paint the outside edges of this, it's going to be nice and smooth. And I'll paint it with a uh, latex base uh, wood um, paint. Um, again, you can uh, ideally use exterior paint to paint it on the outside edges, uh, but you could use interior. I've used interior paint. Um, but the difference is, is exterior paint has a mildew preventative uh, in it, whereas the interior doesn't. So you may at some point get mildew in the paint the bees don't care. Um, so that's my video. Uh, and I'll have, as I always do, if I uh, have notes with it, I'll put notes at the end of the um, video. But you can see the purpose of it. It has two screens on either side of this three quarters board. Uh, and that is a modified snow board or a double screen board 
thank you for watching my video.